Let's talk about Mother Teresa. You guys know who Mother Teresa is. Undoubtedly, you, you know who she is. And if not, you'll know within the next five minutes. All, all you really need to know about Mother Teresa, like if you literally knew nothing about Mother Teresa at all, and I had to introduce you to her, to her uh, I would tell you a story about her feet. And I, it's a story I learned from one of my favorite uh, Christian writers and, and activists and I don't know, I guess you'd call him a minister. His name is Shane Claiborne. And when Shane Claiborne, before he was famous and getting into all sorts of trouble, uh, now, as an adult, he was in college. And Shane Claiborne was this privileged white kid from the suburbs of Philadelphia, uh, grew up with, you know, basically everything he ever needed. Um, and he realized in college, like, he needed to do something to connect with people that are not like him because, you know, the world is not white and the world is not rich and the world is not privileged like he is. And he wanted to kind of find where is Christianity somewhere else? And because he doesn't shoot low, he went ahead and said, well, I'll just go spend three months with Mother Teresa in Calcutta, India. And so he does. He just, he, apparently it was this easy. He just called her up and said, hey, I'd like to come. And she's like, great, you know, uh, come. And, and so he did. And so he, he goes out there as a, as a college student, and immediately they say, well, you know, this is what you're doing here with your internship. And they, they sent him to this house where there were people who were dying. And he said, these people are going to die. Your job is not to do anything other than to show them love and make sure that they, they die with someone holding their hand, showing that they care. And there's, you know, this being India, there, there's, there's Muslims, there's Hindus, there's very few Christians. And, you know, here's you know, a white kid from the suburbs, and this is what he's doing. And they say, okay, well, we want you to go to uh, this leper colony. And he, he, of course, he asks, I didn't know those were still around and not just in the movie Ben-Hur. And he, they said, yes, it exists. So you'll go and, and have a meal and spend time with them and, you know, show them love. You know, show them that they're important. Um, and he said, you know, what happens if I get leprosy? And they said, well, I hope you don't, and go. And that, that was that. And then he comes back, and, you know, they said, hey, you see all these kids running around? Those are orphans. They don't have families. They don't have parents. Uh, go, you know, play with them. Go organize some games. Give them some candy. Show them that they're important. And so this was the summer. Shane Claiborne, um, this, you know, very uh, typical suburban, suburban kid um, hanging out in India because he was looking for Christianity. But he never met Mother Teresa, as it turns out. I never really got to talk to her um, at all through the whole summer. You know, he, she, it's under the umbrella of her ministry, but like, you know, she's sort of in charge of stuff. So, you know, he's just there, he's just there temporarily. And, uh, but he did see her every day at Mass. Every day they had Mass. And, and um, I, you know, I'm not Catholic. I don't know exactly how all this stuff works. But as part of the Mass, she would take off her shoes and she would, you know, sit, you know kneel and she would... She would bow and kneel and all that, and you could see her feet. And Shane Claiborne said that her feet were extremely distinct because they were completely messed up. They were disfigured. They were mangled. They sort of looked like clubs. Uh, they actually, he wondered if she'd gotten leprosy and spent all this time with, with lepers. He thought, you know, does she have leprosy? And all summer, he, he looked and he watched and he looked and he watched. And, and it's really, you know, he's not even paying attention to the mass. You know, he's barely, barely worshiping himself. He just, he's wondering about these feet. He starts thinking, you know, how did this happen? And he wants to ask. But again, you know, you don't know, um, you don't know Mother Teresa. And as a pro tip, if someone has something weird and disfigured on their body, you got to be real close to ask, hey, what's wrong with your body? Like, that's not just a friend conversation. You got to be a little closer than a friend to be like, hey, you look like a weirdo, what's up? So he doesn't want to do that. He doesn't want to just go up to Mother Teresa and say, hey, what's wrong with your feet? He doesn't want to do that. So he, it just, he figures it'll be a mystery until one day someone who lived there permanently just happened to bring it up. And she said to him, to him and some other people, said, hey, have you noticed, um, you know, Mother Teresa's feet? And they said, of course we have. Look at those things. And she said, well, I'll tell you what happens, Okay. Ever since we started this in 1948, um, this was the 90s, by the way, so the last 50 years. So, uh, you know, uh, in 19, 1948, we started this. One of the biggest needs that people here in Calcutta need are shoes. And so people will donate shoes from kind of all over the world in these big shipments uh, for people to wear. Well, people aren't sending, you know, brand new you know, running shoes or, you know, brand new anything. They're sending their old stuff. And so most of the shoes are terrible. 
So Mother Teresa realizes very quickly that most of the shoes are terrible, and she just wants it to be known that she doesn't want anyone that she's encountering with to wear the worst pair of shoes. So from day one in 1948 to, you know, 1997 until she died for about 50 years, Every time there was a shipment of shoes, she would dig through the shoes, she would sort them all out, she would determine which was the worst pair of shoes, and she would take that for herself so no one else needed to have them. And that's how she had shoes. Each and every day, she's you know, working 12 to 16 hour days, helping the poor in these shoes that are the worst shoes anybody has ever sent anyone. No one, for the 50 years that she did this, ever had the worst shoes, because Mother Teresa loved her neighbor so much that even as she was doing this insane ministry, you know, to dying people and lepers and orphans and all of this, like, these, these, these poor people that are the poorest of the poorest of the poor, even, you know, she, she was entitled to, like, a new pair of Nikes, right? But, like, she's, she's entitled to that, you'd think, but she still said, no, I will take the worst one so no one else has to have it. And if you want to know about the love that Mother Teresa had for other people, Shane Claiborne said that's a good place to start. Now that's a good story. I like that story. I've liked that story for 15 years since I read it for the first time. And, and I, I, I've thought a lot about that story, a lot, I mean, that's been like a convicting story for me, um, you know, as I, as I go about my everyday life. But I will be honest, it seems, it seems like a type of thing, like if I say to you, Mother Teresa was a good person, or Mother Teresa was a good Christian, or Mother Teresa did good things, like that is not going out on a limb. Everyone knows Mother Teresa is awesome. Like no one, or was, I mean, she, she passed away, but you know, everybody knows like when Mother Teresa was, was who she was, you know, she was doing ministry, like she became a saint for a reason. Like she's not Saint Mother Teresa. Like, you know, we always... Um, or is it just St. Teresa? It doesn't matter. The point is, we all know she's, she's awesome, right? And I, I have this medal is hanging up on this, in this thing in my house. Uh, I ran a 5K uh, a, year and a, a year ago, and I got a medal. Because here's the bottom line. I only ever run so I can get medals. It's the only reason. It's not for, like, health and fitness. Look at me. But I do like shiny things. So I got this medal from this 5K. And uh, it was, like, World Kindness Day, I believe it was. Uh, that's, a, that's a thing, because we have a, like, there's chocolate chip cookie day, guys. There's a day for everything. Um, but World Kindness Day is, is uh, a day. And so for World Kindness Day, um, there, there, was, uh, there was a 5K, there was a medal, and on the medal is Mother Teresa with, you know, her face and a quote. Like, this is not a, a Christian, you know, running organization. People who are not Christians, people who have nothing to do with religion, people who don't care about God or spirituality or church or anything, they look at Mother Teresa and they're like, yeah, that, that lady was awesome. She's great. Like, World Kindness Day, we're picking Mother Teresa. So it's not, like, it's not a, a real profound statement for me to say Mother Teresa was good. And yet, I looked at this foot story for an entirely different sermon. It was a weird week as we planned this, this sermon here. But an entirely different sermon that had nothing to do with this at all. Looking up this, this, this story, and I'm, I'm looking it up, and I Google, like I pull up on, on my phone, I just type in Mother Teresa, Shane Claiborne, feet. I thought that would get it done. Like that, you know, it was the story from Shane Claiborne. It was about Mother Teresa. It was also about her feet. I thought, okay, that'll pop it up. And it did. It popped up right on the Google Right on the Googling machine, it popped up right there, the story written by Shane Claiborne, exactly as I remembered, right there, and it was second. It was second on the list. First on the list, on Google's algorithm, was an article by a Christian, a Christian article on a Christian website. The title was, what Shane Claiborne and Mother Teresa got wrong about the kingdom of God. It was an article critiquing and breaking down what was not accurate and wrong about Mother Teresa spending 50 years in the worst shoes so everyone else had better shoes. 
which is to say it was nonsense, but it was very sincere. The Google machine had decided that the actual story would be listed after a critique by a Christian of the story saying Shane Claiborne and Mother Teresa are bad. Now look, the internet is filled with haters, obviously. There's like songs about it and everything. But, like there's some, there's some critics that you would expect. Like Christopher Hitchens is really very famous uh, for, for hating Mother Teresa. Christopher Hitchens is also very famous for hating everything religion. Like that's totally on brand to, to, to hate Mother Teresa. Um, there's some people that just really don't like the Catholics. Like the Catholics are just the devil and that's that. And you know, Mother Teresa was definitely Catholic. And so there's people that you know, critique Mother Teresa because she's Catholic. Okay, fine. I expect that. I expect that sort of criticism because, you know, we live in a world where, you know, atheists, you know, they critique religious people. And let's be honest, religious people critique atheists. And, you know, the Catholic Church is, has not always been awesome, so they've sort of earned a little bit of uh, criticism themselves, themselves. But it's weird because that sort of cri criticism I understand. What I found, not just from, you know, the symbolic act of Google putting the critique first, but also, you know, going down the rabbit hole of the internet, is that Mother Teresa is way more popular among people who are not Christians than Christians. I mean, you ask most Christians, at least writing on the internet, um, something about Mother Teresa, and most of them have something negative to say before they say anything good about the woman who, by the way, spent 50 years in the poorest part of the world loving people no one else cares about. She devoted her life to doing what Jesus did in the most dramatic, literal possible way. Like, it just seems weird to me as an aside that if I'm unwilling to do that, maybe I should leave alone the people who are. But that's not how Christians think about it. It's this weird thing where Mother Teresa, <laughs> come on, Mother Teresa, I remember this is not, when I was in high school, uh, I used to, like, I used, I was learning to drive, and I like to drive really fast. And anyone that was driving slow, I used to yell, "What are you, Mother Teresa?" at them. I did this for years until I got like six tickets in three months, and I started becoming Mother Teresa on the road myself, because that's expensive. I mean, like Mother Teresa is like she is synonymous with kindness, and yet the church is like, "No, we have these problems with your 50-year ministry." And it makes me just ask why. Like, why is that how we are? Why are religious people like this? Why are Christian people like this? Why do we always have something to say about everything and everyone? I, I don't know. But the truth is, as I look at this story with Mother Teresa, and I look at, at a whole lot of other things, I, it dawns on me that very often it's the people who are supposed to know God the most who seem to recognize what God is doing the least. Like, we're supposed to know this stuff. And yet, at the end of the day, we have no concept of what God is doing in his world. And I definitely think that's true with Mother Teresa. She's not, obviously wasn't perfect, I get that. But man, did she do some amazing stuff. Her whole life. She did, most, she did more than, by breakfast than most Christians do in a lifetime. And yet she's criticized. Sometimes even before her accomplishments are even named. But that actually puts her, I think, in good company. Because as it turns out, that was also true about the man that Jesus said was the finest human being ever born. Jesus did. Like, yeah, it's weird. I don't know what Jesus' ranking system is or where I'm at, I'm at on it. You know, I don't know if you thought about that. But Jesus one day said there's the greatest man. Like, no one greater born of women, I believe, is exactly like I said. But Jesus said the greatest man that had ever lived was John the Baptist. And as it turns out, John the Baptist was an awful lot like Mother Teresa. It's an awful lot like the people that, in our world, religious people uh, and Christians criticize 
and condemn and attack. John the Baptist had haters. He could have recorded a song and everything. And here's why. This is what we read at the beginning of the, the, the gospel according to Mark. This is the very beginning of how Mark tells the story of Jesus. He says this. He says, this messenger was John the Baptist. He was in the wilderness and he preached that people should be baptized to show that they had repented of their sins and turned to God to be forgiven. All of Judea, including all the people in Jerusalem, went out to see and hear John. And when they confessed their sins, he baptized them in the Jordan River. His clothes were woven from coarse camel hair, and he wore a leather belt around his waist. For food, he ate locusts and wild honey. Now, first of all, it's interesting that that's how the Gospel of Mark starts. Like, Mark and, and, and Luke both are, are saying, okay, well, how do I start the story of Jesus? And they don't actually start with Jesus. Jesus, like, comes later. They start with John the Baptist, which should tell us how important he is. But then what Mark says here should tell us how uh, sort of weird John the Baptist is. There's really two massive takeaways we need to take one by one here from, from this incident. Okay, John the Baptist, according to Mark, is a guy who lives in the wilderness. And John the Baptist is a guy uh, who baptizes other people. Hence the name John the Baptist. Let's, let's, again, let's start that. Let's take those one by one. John the Baptist lived in the wilderness. And what I mean by John the Baptist lived in the wilderness, I do not mean like he moved out to the suburbs. Or like he got this cute little farm out here with like five acres and some goats. That is not what John the Baptist did. Okay, this was not like, this was not a cool, uh, positive life move. We know what we need to know about John the Baptist from the way he looked and, yeah, his eating habits. Uh, it says that he wore camel hair um, and he had a leather belt. And like right now I'm wearing, uh, I think it's leather. It might be fake, but it's a belt that sort of is like that. And so I think sometimes because like a lot of us are wearing leather belts right now, or at least fake ones, we, we think, oh, well, that's not a big deal. He was fashionable. You know, he got to the, he, he shopped at the mall and everybody else shopped at Target. That is not what this is, okay? He had a leather belt because leather was a thing he could get from the animals in the wilderness. He had uh, camel hair because it was what he could make his clothes out of because he lived in the wilderness. Living in the wilderness meant he lived completely divorced from and as a recluse away from society and civilization at large. John the Baptist was, he wasn't just away from people. John the Baptist intentionally escaped people. He was as far as he possibly could be away from people, and he finds himself without clothing. And he doesn't want to go back to people to, you know, go to Target to buy clothes. That's not what he wants to do. So he doesn't want to go back. So instead, he simply says, okay, well, I'll make what I've got with what I've got around me. And he lives in the wilderness, so there's lots of animals. John the Baptist is essentially homeless. Uh, what shelter he has is what he can build for himself out in the middle of nowhere. And that includes his clothing. And it includes his food. Okay? He does not eat locusts and wild honey because, you know, he saw, he read on NPR about some new, um, you know, hip protein source that is environmentally pro friendly. And there's these insects and that's what you do. Have you guys seen all those articles? Like we're all going to be eating grasshoppers in 20 years. Like, yeah, maybe your kids, but not me. I can't eat bugs. I just can't. Anyway, as an aside, it's not because of that. Like, you didn't go to Whole Foods and be like, where's your wild honey section? I would like local, please, for my allergies. It's not what he does. He's eating locusts because they're there. He's eating wild honey because, like, there's a hive. He is completely away from everywhere. He is essentially, to the outside world, a raving lunatic. He's in the wilderness. And then when he shows up with people, he begins to baptize them. And that's a fancy word for dunking them in water. He starts like play drowning them. And that's the truth. That's what baptism is. It's a, it's a fake drowning. It really is. It's, it's, it's pretend drowning. Like it's, it, the whole symbolism here is of repenting, of turning back on who you used to be, of a new person being born. Like the old person is gone, the new person is now here. That is play death. Okay, and, and so he's, you imagine you're here this for the first time, and I do mean that for the first time. John the Baptist came up with this. 
Well, maybe God inspired it. That's a whole conversation. But John the Baptist comes up with this. This is his idea. He's the first guy to do it. And there's a lot of times, like, you'll read from people, oh, well, he was inspired by the Jewish washing ceremonies. Maybe. But Jewish washing ceremonies were these, like, very, like, devout, stuffy, uh, fancy affairs that followed, like, very strict rules and regulations. And they were within the temple where God was supposed to live. John the Baptist, he's out at the river just, like, dunking folks. And, and I mean, this is, this is not devout. This is not... Uh, a, this, is, this is a practical ceremonial act, a symbol of repentance, of God is going to show up in a powerful way. The kingdom of God is coming. The kingdom of God is here. We've got to get ready. Turn to God so you're ready. What I'm trying to tell you is baptism was an alternate act to worshiping at the temple. It was a countercultural act. Everyone else goes to the temple. John the Baptist is saying, let's do this in the river. Everybody else is there, they're searching with what's going on at the temple, with where this is where God goes. I have to go to where God is supposed to be. John the Baptist says, no, God is already here. God is already among you. God is already within you. God is already all of this stuff. So let's, let's make a, an act you will remember so that you know and you are committed to knowing where God is, to living that out. John was making something completely new. Functionally creating new worship. In the framework of a religion where, I don't know if you've read the Old Testament, but you're not allowed to do that. Like, they're pretty strict about how you worship God. And John the Baptist is like, yeah, I don't care about any of that. Let's play drown you. And let's live a different life. And the reason he did that is extremely important for us to see. And it's found in a verse that we probably skip over at the Christmas story. Here's what we read at the beginning of the gospel according to Luke about the parents of John the Baptist. We read this. When Herod was king of Judea, there was a Jewish priest named Zechariah. He was a member of the priestly order of Abijah. And his wife, Elizabeth was also from the priestly line of Aaron. That seems like one of those boring introductions to something. It doesn't mean a lot, but that means everything. You see, in the Jewish understanding of how a priest is made, priests, are not, priests don't choose what they do. Priests are chosen from birth. It's all about your lineage. It's all about who you are supposed to be. It's all about who your dad is and then who his dad is and who his dad is and his dad. Which means John the Baptist's father, Zechariah, was a priest. And his grandfather was a priest. And his great-grandfather was a priest. And his great-great-grandfather was a priest. And his great-great-great-grandfather was a priest. And you can go all the way back into those Old Testament stories like hundreds and hundreds of years before and you're going to find a priest that is in the same family line as John the Baptist. If that, was, if that was all, John the Baptist was born to be a priest. But that's not all. John the Baptist's mother was Elizabeth. And she was also in a family of priests. Now, the Jews didn't let women be priests. <laughs> that would be silly. But that was a joke, guys, if you don't know me. Man. So she's not a priest, but she's the... <laughs> it's a Don's up There's like visitors and stuff. Oh, man. Anyway, so uh, where am I even at here? So Elizabeth's father was a priest, and her grandfather was a priest, and her great-great-grandfather and all that. You have priestly lines on both sides. John the Baptist wasn't just born to be a priest. He was born to be like mega priest. Like he was born like maybe to be the high priest. He was a, a priest in a family of priests. And one day you find him in the wilderness making his own clothes, eating bugs. John the Baptist refused his calling. Refused. John the Baptist turned his back on what his parents wanted him to do. Not just wanted, expected, assumed he would do. John the Baptist was a massive disappointment to the very lovely parents that he had, Zechariah and Elizabeth. Elizabeth. 
I'm just going to sit there on that one for a second. Because I feel like there's some people that need to hear that. John the Baptist disappointed his parents simply by who he was. And John the Baptist disappointed the whole line. He's got this, this priestly line. Like, he grew up with other people who were going to be priests. He was buddies with other people who were going to be priests. And they all became priests. <laughs> and John the Baptist is in the wilderness eating bugs. John the Baptist defiantly, rebelliously refused to be a priest. Everything John did, when he made his clothes, he was rebelling against who he was supposed to be. When he baptized people every single time, he was being defiant towards the organized religion he turned his back on. John the Baptist looked at organized religion and said, that is not for me. And you can ask why, or you can just read the New Testament. Because see, if John the Baptist had been a priest, John the Baptist would have been hanging out with all the folks who killed Jesus. Like he would have been there for the arrests and the trials and the crucifixion. John the Baptist would have been sitting right there. John the Baptist, if he had done what he was going to do, he would have been sold out to Rome. Because the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the temple and all of them, and all of these people, they, they have compromised. They're corrupt. And it's funny because I think that if John could see it, all of his buddies he grew up with also saw it. And they didn't care. They got in line to be corrupted. But John the Baptist said, no, I can't be corrupt. These people don't care about God. These people don't care about God's children. These people don't care about truth or justice or grace or mercy or love. And I do. And so John escapes. He turns his back on organized religion so that he can find God. He turns his back on the priesthood so he can find a real calling. As you might imagine, he was not overly popular for doing so. This is what we read happens in the uh, beginning of the book of John. One more time, one more passage from the beginning of a gospel. This is, uh, this is what happens. It says, this was John's testimony when the Jewish leaders sent priests and temple assistants from Jerusalem to ask John, who are you? Are you Elijah? No, he replied. Are you the prophet we are expecting? No. Then who are you? We need an answer for those who sent us. What do you have to say about yourself? John replied in the words of the prophet Isaiah, I am a voice shouting in the wilderness. Clear the way for the Lord's coming. Then the Pharisees who had been sent asked him, If you are not the Messiah or Elijah or the prophet, what right do you have to baptize? Now, I've heard this passage taught and, and explained in several ways that gives way too much credit to the Pharisees and priests. Like, it's a good faith question. Like, they really want to know who John is. Guys, they knew who John was. He's the son of Zechariah and Elizabeth. He's supposed to be a priest. He's not. He's turned his back, and now he lives in the wilderness. Saying, who are you, is rhetorical. And it's a bullying move. They're attempting to be cruel. They're attempting to put him in his place so he stops doing what he's doing because he's tracking attention. He's got all sorts of disciples at this point. He's got people that are coming out. By the way, the temple system that held people down and gave only you know, power to some people who were beholden to Rome, it's going to shock you to learn that that wasn't overly popular with the people. So now here's a guy saying, forget the temple, forget Rome, forget the priesthood, forget all of that. Live a life in acknowledgement of God, loving other people. This symbolic act in baptism. The people loved it. Because, see, that's all people wanted anyway. People wanted to love God and love other people. They may not have worded it that way, but that's all they ever really wanted. They wanted the peace that comes from knowing God. They wanted the, the peace that comes from, from, from caring about other people. That's all they want. And John the Baptist recognizes that. So do the Pharisees. 
and so do the priests. And they say, who do you think you are? Not because they literally thought Elijah was reincarnated. That's not what the Jews believed, by the way. They did not believe, not believe that was popular, or possible, I mean. Uh, they, didn't, or they weren't saying, are you really this dead guy back to life? That's not what they're saying. What they're saying is, you're not Elijah. Who are you to talk to us? You're not a prophet. Who are you to argue with the temple? You're not the Messiah. Who are you to lead these people? And I love the idea of John quoting Isaiah because what it tells me is John had studied in the temple, which means his decision to leave organized religion was not one he made um, without a great deal of thought. He knew exactly what he was doing and why. He'd studied with them. He's quoting their own scriptures. And what John says with all sincerity and humility is, I'm no one. I'm, I'm just, making, just making a way so the one who is someone can show up. And these people are ready because you're not doing it. You guys, I feel like we need to just say this as, as bluntly as possible. We believe that John the Baptist was a prophet. Like, he was right. What he did was right. What he did was righteous and holy and great. I trust Jesus. When Jesus says John the Baptist is the greatest guy that's ever lived, I believe that. But it is so important for us to understand this. Had we been alive 2,000 years ago, and if we had been listening to a guy like me, a leader in the church, a leader in the temple, a leader in, the, the, in religion, this sermon would end with that John the Baptist is dangerous, heretical, and wrong. Don't follow him. We have to understand this story. Oh, the story of Jesus. Also, this, this is part of the story of Jesus. It is countercultural. It is defiant against the worst of religion. It is finding God outside of religion because religion has failed. Good, honorable, civilized people 2,000 years ago would have told you, don't listen to John the Baptist, a.k.a. the finest man that has ever lived according to God in the flesh. And of course they killed Jesus, so, you know, what do they know? But we live in a world. Everybody's got something to say about everything. And I don't even know that I know why. You know, I said, why, why, why are we like this? Why are we like this with Mother Teresa? Why are, we, why are they like this with John the Baptist? And I can come up with ideas. We could sit here and, and spitball for you know, the next three hours. But regardless, it is what it is. Which means it is exceedingly important that we say this. When all is said and done... The haters don't matter. When all is said and done, no matter how loud they are, how convincing they are, what fancy titles they have, the critics do not count. It just doesn't matter. Because <laughs> John the Baptist, well, he made a critic of the entirety of the religion of the quote-unquote people of God. And Jesus gave him a standing ovation for it. Clearly, critics did not matter to John or Mother Teresa or you and I. This morning, our first week of our November series called Camel Hair and Locusts. <laughs> John the Baptist was a giant weirdo. And I want us to remember that every time we see that slide. Man, this guy was odd. And he was the greatest man that ever lived. It's almost like being odd is not an insult just a descriptor that very often tells us that we're on the right track. And our first lesson from John the Baptist in this November series is this. Your faith doesn't need to make sense to anyone but God. Your faith doesn't need to make sense to anyone but God. 
Mother Teresa, very famously, I mean, she's famous. She had a lot of critics during her day, too. Um, that anti-Catholic thing really happened a lot. And uh, you know, she lived through the, all the you know, the trials in and, the and 60s and 70s and stuff. And she was alive for all that. And so, you know, all that stuff. And so Mother Teresa had this thing where she literally would always, whenever she was made aware of her critics, she always simply smiled and wished them well. Because they, they just didn't matter at all to her. It just, for Mother Teresa, it, it, was, it could not have been less important what other people thought. And I think that's awesome. And John the Baptist is clearly the same way. As we're going to go, I mean, as we're going to talk about, you know, over the next few weeks, I mean, John the Baptist goes to his grave not caring in any way what anyone thinks of him. And that's awesome, and that's great. But I'll be honest, that's not me. Man, like, that's just not me. I want it to be me. I really do. Like, I'm working on it. And that's why I'm so glad. That's why I'm so glad for these examples. You know, like, you know, not just in the Bible. You know, John the Baptist in the Bible and Mother Teresa. Like, obviously, these are wonderful examples. But, like, I'm so glad for those examples. But, man, it's just not me. Criticism bothers me of what I do and what I believe and what I am. And just really, like, I mean, I'll probably smile at you. But inside, man. And so we just have to understand that this is just the way it is. If you are living a life in which no one is criticizing you, guess what? They're doing it behind closed doors. That means they're not telling you to your face. That's all that means. Like, you are being criticized probably right now by someone. Probably in your family. Families are great. Like, right now, they're talking like, God, oh, Joel, what's he doing today? That's happening. We've got to get to a place working hard day in and day out to prioritize what God thinks over what anybody else thinks. It's so hard. Guys, it's so hard. It's so hard to say, okay, I will care what God thinks and only what God thinks. But you see, that's what we have to do because we live in a world of so much noise and so much criticism and so much nonsense. And if Mother Teresa is going to get criticized, you are not Mother Teresa. John the Baptist is going to get, I mean, you are even less John the Baptist. It's going to happen. And so our response needs to be to prioritize Christ and Christ alone. We'll spend the next three weeks talking about exactly how we can do that from John the Baptist's life. But more than anything, it's just an attitude. It's just a decision. And it's just an accepting the promise of God that his opinion is what counts not anyone else's. And that is what we choose when we follow him, by grace, in faith, each and every day. The Bible teaches that when we want to do that, that we are to, just like John the Baptist taught, to repent and be baptized. It's a little different, but for our purposes, it's, it's not anymore an act of defiance. To live out your baptism, to stand for truth, uh, and especially in this world, uh, in this day and age, uh, to, to say, I'm going to do the truth and nothing but the truth, to seek out justice, to really care about other people, no matter who they are, those are acts of rebellion and defiance. But remember, our baptisms say we're dead. The old is gone, the new has been born again. To be baptized, to live baptism, is an act of defiance. And the Bible teaches that's what we do. We've got a nice warm baptistry, all sorts, of people, all sorts of people can do it. Let's talk. If you're already a merciful believer in Christ, and you're looking for a perfect church home, it's not here. I forgot to tell the musicians to come up here. But we do serve a perfect God. We want to connect, we want to call, we want to cultivate, we want to meet new people, we want to share the gospel, we want to grow up, and we do it. And we want to be people who care about the will and opinion of God. And no matter who criticizes us for that, no matter who criticizes you for that, and whoever you are, whatever you are, understand who you are is not up for debate. Whoever you are, whatever you are, it doesn't matter. It's not up for debate. If you have peace with God within you, if you are loving your neighbors, if you are following Christ, it just couldn't begin to care. It matter less what other people think. As we stand and as we sing.